So we've been talking about finite state machines lately, and I've showed you what finite state machines are, how they work, um, and even how to design finite state machines. So the next topic that's worth discussing is how do we take a, an existing finite machine and translate it into a circuit? Um, so to go through an example, uh, we will take a look at this, the finite state machine uh, high-level logic, first of all. We can see, just to refresh your memory, right, that uh, the way a finite state machine circuit works is that I take in my inputs and with some logic, right, I need to determine what my next state will be. So that's a factor of the inputs as well as the current state that I'm in. The state itself is stored in a register which comprises, uh, which is comprised of flip-flops. So we know there's going to be some flip-flops in our circuits. And then finally I decide what my output value should be. And again, we are going to focus primarily on synchronous outputs in this uh, particular video. Um, in the next set of videos, we'll start talking about asynchronous outputs as well. So let's take a look at the finite state machine that we actually looked at in uh, a couple videos ago. Uh, this is our fair arbiter um, finite state machine. And just to quick refresher, uh, what this machine does is it controls access to a shared resource. So if I have a disk, and I have two processes that want to write to that disk, but only one process can do so at any given time, this finite state machine will control access so that only one process can write to disk at any point in time. So I see this in two different forms, right? I see the finite state machine over here on the left, and then on the right, I see this uh, state uh, transition diagram as well. And so if you're given a finite state machine or a state transition diagram, right? The first, if you want to translate it into a circuit, one of the first things that you should do is count how many states there are. In this case, I see four states. And I know from our discussion on binary that if I want to count to four, I can do that with only two bits of information. So in order to store what state I'm in, I need to remember at least two bits. Right? I can't do it with any fewer than two bits, and any more than two bits is extra. I just don't need them. So I know for a fact that I'm going to need at least two flip-flops, or in other words, I'm going to need a two-bit register in order to store the state for this particular uh, finite state machine. Okay. The other thing that we need to consider is how to transition from one state to the next. Remember, that depends on what state we are currently in, as well as what my input values are. And so the way that that traditionally works is that we are going to use a multiplexer or perhaps multiple multiplexers um, for each particular state that we have, right? And then what those multiplexers will do is um, they will use the current inputs as select bits, right? And then the inputs to the muxes themselves will be the next states in terms of bits. So if we decide to use um, 0, 0, right, as our two bits for idle 0, then we might have a multiplexer that says, you know, if um, R0 is 0 and R1 is also 0, then I want my next state to be 0, 0. And we could actually turn this uh, state uh, diagram here into something that re more resembles a truth table, as a matter of fact. Um, so let's take a look at an example of a partially completed circuit for this finite state machine. This is not a complete circuit for this finite state machine. It's only a partial circuit. Uh, up here we see the case where the state is idle zero, right? We are in state idle zero. What state do we want to happen next? What state do we want to um, proceed to next? You can see I have two multiplexers here, right? And the selects on those multiplexers is tied directly to our inputs. So I have three options. I actually have three options um, for destinations. I have three transitions um, from state idle zero. I can either remain in idle zero, I can go to busy zero, or I can go to busy one. And you see here that um, if I want to go to state busy zero, for example, that means that R zero must be high. And so this multiplexer here is connected to um, R zero. And if it goes high, busy zero is going to be the state that is output. Right? But let's assume that R zero is not high. Well, we, if we take a look at this transition here, we see that if R one is high, then I want to um, transition to busy one. So when this multiplexer here is connected 
right, to R1. And if R1 is high, then busy1 is going to be passed through as our next state. If neither of those is the case, right, if both of these are zero, then what happens? Well, I've got a loop back here where you see the current state is coming out. And that current state will pass through both of these multiplexers if both of my inputs are zero. And that will ultimately become our next state. This will be our next state. This AND gate here is used to detect whether we, what state we are currently in. So you see this input here is labeled state equals idle zero. I just need to detect whether our state bits are both zero, right? And if they are, then this branch will be active. If I'm not in idle zero, right, remember states are represented by bits in this particular case. We have two bits, right? Remember that fact. Um, if I'm not in state idle zero, let's say I'm in busy zero instead, then this AND gate will be off. And I have another AND gate down here for busy zero. And you can see I have another multiplexer to help us dictate what state we should be in next. From busy zero, I have two choices. I can remain in state busy zero, or I can transfer to state idle one. If I'm going to transfer to state idle one, that means the R zero bit is going to be zero. So on my select bit to this multiplexer, I have R zero hooked up to an inverter. If R zero is zero, then idle one will be passed through and that will become our next state. If R zero is not zero, if it's one instead, then we will remain in the busy zero state, and you can see that the current state is being fed in through this multiplexer here. Right. So this actually accomplishes the ne next state logic for two of the four states that we have available. In the middle, we see I have a flip-flop. This is the circuit diagram for a flip-flop. And here, right, we see slash n. This n, in this case, refers to how many bits we need to store the state for this particular state machine. For the case of this particular state machine, remember that n is equal to 2. So a lot of these uh, wires that we see on this particular diagram are going to be 2 bits wide. They're going to be 2-bit buses. Um, these up here, feeding into the multiplexers, are all 2 bits, right? Feeding into the end gates here are all 2 bits. Feeding into the OR gates over here is 2 bits, right? These are all 2-bit signals, since the state is 2 bits wide. And then finally, the last piece of our uh, circuit is the output. So how do we set the output? Well, here we have a block, right, that's just checking for equality. That's all this is doing. Uh, in a future class, we will actually take a look at this and see how to check for equality using a block such as this. Uh, but for now, just assume that this is functioning uh, properly to check equality. What we're saying here is that if we are in state busy zero, if busy zero is equal to our current state, then I want grant zero to be true. If our current state is equal to busy one, if busy one is equal to our current state, then I want grant one to be true. So this defines our synchronous output in this particular case. Right? We can get all of that information either from the finite state machine or perhaps more appropriately from the state diagram, the state transition diagram. Now this circuit does use a bit of shorthand. You see here that I'm using actual state names, right? These aren't actual bits, these are state names. And for the most part, I'm okay with you using state names in your circuit diagrams, right? But I do want you to remember that in an actual circuit, these state names are enumerated. So they are assigned combinations of bits. Uh, based on how many states there are. So one such enumeration for this set of states might say that idle 0 is going to be 0, 0, and busy 0 will be 0, 1, idle 1 will be 1, 0, and then busy 1 will be 1, 1. And those actual bits will be moving through the circuit uh, when it's um, synthesized by VHDL, for example. In future classes, we will talk about how we can enumerate these uh, states in more detail uh, when you're writing VHDL code. Um, but for drawing circuits, I'm actually okay with this format of using this shorthand uh, with the state names. It makes it a little bit easier to understand. Um, as long as you understand that, um, you know, these actual states are represented by bits in a real-life circuit.